Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. And if you're new, welcome to my channel. My name is Stephanie Yates Anya Buile, Steph Anya for short, and I'm a licensed associate marriage and family therapist. Today's video will be all about married at first sight. Today I'm gonna to be reviewing or analyzing Eric and Virginia's relationship. If you're curious, stay tuned. Okay, so I am a huge Married at First Sight fanatic. I've been watching it since season one, and this season is just... Let me finish. No, we're gonna go. I'm just saying, what are you, you doing here? right now? Too much. If you're watching this season, it's honestly just too much. But what I'm gonna be doing is breaking down the couples. Now, I feel like Eric and Virginia, I wanted to start with them because I have a lot to say where people can learn and maybe apply it to their own relationships. And so I wanted to start with them. Let's jump right in. So whenever I see people talking about Eric and Virginia, they're always coming from the lens of whose fault is it? Who's doing it wrong, saying it wrong? And honestly, from a marriage and family therapist perspective, if you're new to my channel, we use a systemic perspective. We're never looking for the one person to blame or the one event to blame. We're looking for the pattern, what's happening between both people or all people that's contributing to a pattern. So really they both definitely contribute to the malfunction in the relationship. I'm going to analyze them as individuals, the strengths and weaknesses for them as individuals and my speculations as to what has led to particularly the weaknesses that we're seeing both of them exhibit in this relationship. Now keep in mind, anybody getting married at first sight, it's going to be a stressful situation. So this is not to judge them or rag on them. This is really just to give people more insight why they're acting this way. Why would one person see it this way and another person seeing it that way? People are just picking a side and running with it. So let's provide a little bit more balance to what's happening here through my eyes. I also wanna give the disclaimer that I am not their therapist and we're only seeing such a limited view of their personalities, right? This is still TV. So what I'm saying is based on what we've seen so far, there could be more episodes in the future that would change my opinion and there might be things that are happening off camera that we'll never see. So keep that in mind, this is still based on a very limited scope. So from my perspective, there are some toxic relationships on Married at First Sight hands down. This relationship, I wouldn't describe it as toxic, at least not at this time. These two do have their struggles, but they seem to both be committed to trying to make it work. And that to me is the most important thing, especially if you're doing an experiment like this, you wanna come in with an open mind. So let's start with Virginia. The biggest factor that I think contributes to their malfunction as a couple on Virginia's part is her attachment style. So I have an entire video on attachment styles, breaking down the different types, if you're interested in that, I'll put it in the cards and I'll try to remember to put it in the description box. But attachment style for Virginia, I think, is her avoidant attachment. And an avoidant attachment is really the result of having parents who are emotionally unavailable, particularly if you're hurt or if you're sick. The biggest sign that Virginia has an avoidant attachment style is when she says that typically at this point she runs. If you watch the show, she always talks about that she's gonna run. In the past couple years have just kind of ran. Like I've always had this like fear, the fear of rejection really, or fear of abandonment. Okay. Um, sometimes like this, not even this, like a week ago is normally when I run. <laughs> This is the point in a relationship where she runs. And what that means is that getting close and being comfortable with somebody, being vulnerable and open and depending on them is so uncomfortable for her that she typically runs away. And that's where the term avoidant comes from in that avoidant attachment style. It's also known as insecure avoidant attachment style. So it usually means that you don't feel a security or stability in your relationships. One of the biggest triggers for her is going to be a person threatening to leave her because she already has an expectation that people will leave. If you watch this show, then you probably remember Virginia talking about her parents. In the very first episode, one of her biggest fears was that her dad wasn't going to show up for her wedding. So as you can already see there, she has a huge expectation of being let down by her primary caregivers, which is what develops our attachment styles. She talked about uh, when her parents got a divorce, she basically took her mom's side and didn't talk to her dad. And then her mom went away. 
day. She moved to a different state and her dad was still around. So she had to forgive him really because her mom had left. So even in that early experience of trying to build an alliance with one of her primary caregivers, ultimately they still went away. Now this is not to blame her parents, but this is just to say these are the kind of experiences that typically contribute to an avoidant attachment style. Because Virginia has these expectations of abandonment and rejection, one of the worst things that Eric does is he gives her ultimatums and says, I'm done. We're done. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, what I suspect is happening with Eric, but that is one of the biggest triggers that contributes to the dysfunction of this couple. Eric goes back and forth between saying I'm done and then saying I'm not going anywhere. So those are things that are gonna contribute to her feeling really worried. We even saw her saying to him in one scene, I think they were celebrating their month anniversary. Because I feel like you are like very, very into me right now. And like, okay. it's just like, I I feel like it's not realistic to think that that will always be that way. She's always waiting for the other shoe to drop. She doesn't want to get too comfortable in being happy or too comfortable in being secure. And I don't fault her for that. She's probably had many, many experiences that have taught her that she shouldn't get comfortable with those things. And so her avoidant attachment, I find, is probably the biggest factor that impacts the relationship on her end. So how does Virginia deal with the anxiety that results from an avoidant attachment? She is resisting change. And so we see a lot of times in their scenes, their biggest arguments are Virginia being very firm about not changing her life for this marriage, or more specifically, I'd say not changing her life for him. She perceives anything that he suggests as a compromise, as a form of control. And that's because her sticking to her own routine is another way of her being able to rely on herself. So what she does is she wants to stay in her own apartment if possible. She doesn't want to change her drinking habits or her nights out or anything about her life because as long as she doesn't make those changes, she still can predict what's going to happen. She's only relying on herself. So the idea of having to compromise or sacrifice something for another person when it might not work out is really scary for her. So the way that she deals with it is by resisting change. She wants to focus on keeping things the same because these are things that she can account for. And that's actually getting in the way of their relationship a lot. Another way that she's definitely dealing with the stress of being in this relationship is through alcohol. And it's something that we've seen played out. Now, I've watched many seasons of Married at First Sight and there'll be claims from one spouse that the other spouse drinks too much. And usually this just boils down to people having different lifestyles. Now, I wouldn't consider those people to be alcoholics just based on what we saw on screen, but we don't know for sure. Um, and I can't say that Virginia is an alcoholic either, right? I am not her therapist. I don't know about her relationship with alcohol. I don't know if we're only seeing her filming on days where she's already high stress. We really don't know. But it does definitely seem like alcohol is one of the ways that she addresses her stress. We pretty much will see Virginia with the drink in every single scene that she's in, whether it's with the girls or with Eric. So I think that her reliance on alcohol definitely could play a factor in what's happening in their relationship. But again, I wouldn't diagnose her with alcoholism without seeing her. And I also wanna talk about Virginia's strengths. I think her biggest strength is her honesty. Even for her to say that at this point, usually I run, that's a lot more self-awareness than I see from a lot of the couples or individuals that I see in my practice. You know, if you have a tendency of running, you're always gonna typically feel justified in leaving. And so the fact that she can be self-aware and communicate that she has that tendency, at least it gives Eric the insight into what might be happening with her when it seems like she's self-sabotaging in the relationship. Relationship. And another strength I see in her that I personally really like is that she stands up for herself. Now she does do it in a way sometimes that gets in the way of the relationship, but I do love that I think originally I was concerned about Eric being older than her if she was going to just kind of 
look for that father figure and do whatever he expected of her. But I do love that she is standing up for herself and certain things are non-negotiables for her. She should work a bit more on compromising and being open, but I do admire the fact that her first thought is to advocate for herself. Um, and you know, other people might look at that a different way, but that is a strength that I personally like to see. All right, let's move on to Eric. So Eric, there are two big things that I see from him that majorly contribute to the dysfunction of the relationship. So first, Eric seems to show a lot of the signs of a superiority complex. He likes to compare. A person is constantly comparing themselves to others and they see themselves as being the greater of the two. And we see that a lot with Eric and Virginia. One thing he always says is, I've done this before. Again, I've, I've done this before, so I just knew what I you- I love when you say that. I don't mean it like that. I just, I know things that are expected and how it should go. To put that into context, he's the first person ever married at first sight history to have been married before. And the interesting thing about it is that he almost brags about this. Like having a failed marriage gives him all of the insight into having a successful one. And so he says that often, I've done this before, you haven't, I know how this works. Another thing he always says is my parents are still together and you don't have that. So much respect for you with, with what you've gone through because I haven't and I'm very fortunate that I've gotten to see how my parents have been, which is like almost perfection, to be honest. Like that's what I want, that's what I look for. So he again is saying he has all of the keys to a perfect relationship because his parents are still together. Now, just being together, a lot of us would say that that's not necessarily a successful marriage. Just being together, we don't know the ins and outs of their marriage. Again, I think it's him trying to establish superiority between the two of them so that his opinion is taken more seriously than hers. Another one he'll say all the time is, I'm older than you, so I've already been through that phase. What bothers you? I think it's just where she's at in her life and where I'm at. You know, I respect where she's at because I was there. What do you mean? Like I mean, party she, life? I mean, a lot, some of that, you know. Um, she hasn't had the kind of relationships that I, I have had. So Stable I relationships. So I understand, them. understand them. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I understand what goes into them and what both people need to bring. And she has not had those. Okay. And that's him really attacking her way of life. Virginia is social. She likes to drink. She likes to be with friends. Um, and he basically tells her this is just a phase. I've been through that. I'm older than you. Even in an episode where they kind of focused on the dogs, interestingly enough, he was comparing his dog to her dog and saying how he's got great control over his dog and her dog needs to be trained. My dog, like, he's just such a good dog and he listens. I don't need leashes to go out outside he's not gonna run away there's there's none of that i love rocky i love him to death but he needs a certain amount of me being firm with him you know my military background all, all these kind of things and he might have a point about those things i'm not saying he's wrong but the comparison he could have simply said i would like for us to go get our dogs trained or get your dog trained there was no need for him to compare the dogs and so that need to always compare yourself to others and come out on top all of these instances just really point to eric viewing himself in my opinion as better and that condescending tone with virginia her being an advocate for herself it doesn't go well and so he uses this so that he can help explain or provide insight into his opinion on things but she just takes it as him being controlling or trying to be condescending so that's actually a very maladaptive way of communicating and that's how he contributes most of the dysfunction in the relationship another way we see eric with his superiority complexes in comparison to the other couples right he always tries to emphasize how well he and virginia are doing they haven't had any issues but when you look at it from Virginia's perspective, she's going to the people complaining, right? So she actually sees that there are problems in the relationship and Eric is just like, hey, it's working for me. Everything is going great. And my relationship is thriving and a lot of the other couples aren't thriving. So again, he's viewing things as I'm better. We see this in a lot of different areas with Eric.
So another thing that I see from Eric is a cognitive distortion. I do have a video already all about cognitive distortions and what they are, but cognitive distortions are basically, they're developed from schemas, just beliefs we have in life that are really just kind of unchanging and we see the world through those lens. The most common cognitive distortion that I see with Eric is all or nothing thinking. And that ties back to a lot of the behaviors that we've already talked about with him. For him to go from, if you don't do this, I'm done. If you break that, then that's it. To saying, I'm not going anywhere when he's trying to comfort her. But guess what? I'm gonna support you no matter what happens. It doesn't even matter what you do or what's going on. That's all or nothing thinking, right? I'm not going anywhere to I'm done, those are two extremes. Another way that we see him with that all or nothing thinking is when he talks about male and female relationships, right? He doesn't want Virginia to have any male friends and he's very adamant about that. He's like, I, that is not okay with me. A guy and a girl can never be friends, ever, except for a few things. He says, unless the guy is gay, or if he's married to one of your friends. Those are his only exceptions. So he essentially wanted her to not have any guy friends anymore. That's all or nothing thinking. You know, either the person's completely into you or they can't be into you at all. And if not, if they're into you, then they can't have a relationship. But then fast forward to when he meets her guy friends, he's hugging him and like, dude, I'm so glad to meet you. Again, that all or nothing thinking, extreme thinking. This also reminds me of a defense mechanism called splitting, where you see things as everything is black and white, and you see it that way because that's the safest way for you to understand the world. Gray zones can be uncomfortable, so this is right, this is wrong. And based on what we've heard from Eric, he doesn't exactly have the most open mind about things. I remember him adamantly saying, these are my beliefs and I will never change them. Um, and so that is one of the things that really gets in the way because when you have a person who has all or nothing thinking and they don't have an open mind and they're in a conversation with their partner and that partner is saying things that differs from how they believe, but they also have a tendency of being condescending and trying to establish superiority to win the argument, we see a negative pattern happening there, right? That's gonna get in the way of their conversations and them being productive when they need to make decisions about things. Virginia said to him one time that she didn't wanna move into his apartment. Now, I will say Virginia has a tendency to be very stubborn, and it seems like she wasn't really coming into marriage with the expectation that she would have to compromise. I mean, I can just keep living in my place until we get our place. You know, live separate, that doesn't make any sense. But Eric is not the best with compromising either. I see the compromise, it's pretty easy. You'll come stay with me until we find another place. How is that a compromise? That's just what you wanna do. The outcome of that conversation was him saying, well, I know where I'm living and if you're not living there, that's on you, essentially. Like, you just live wherever you need to live. And that is not a way to deal with conflict in a marriage or a relationship. You both need to walk away understanding each other's perspectives a bit better. Now, I will say Eric's strength is that he is a great communicator when he isn't in defense mode. I particularly liked his proactive communication with letting everyone know that he'd been married before. It's like the only thing that I have to kind of get off my chest before we start this. Uh, it was previously married. Oh. Yes. Talking to her parents about it, talking to her about it. The way that he prepared them in that conversation was really good. A lot of times I see him trying to understand how Virginia thinks and try to talk to her, especially in moments where she's very, very anxious. I see him trying to sometimes reason with her and not raise his voice. So I do think that he has great potential to be a communicator, right? He's good at sharing what his opinion is. I think where he struggles the most is in being open to what other people's ideas are. And so that is where he really has a weakness that kind of directly combats that strength. So I, I do wanna leave you guys with some tips and some advice on how to deal with these dynamics. If you are a person who has an avoidant attachment style, you need to be aware of what your triggers are. And so it could be something like a person not texting back quickly or a person not answering your phone call. It could be feel like a person's not making eye contact with you. We're all gonna have different things. And then I suggest that you try to understand the roots of those triggers. 
because you know, did you have a parent that refused to make eye contact with you growing up, for example? This way you can communicate to your partner the things that are happening that make you feel like, you know, this is tapping right into the very thing that I've always been afraid of. So with an avoidant attachment style, it's a lot about communication. If you're dating someone with an avoidant attachment style, you never want to use phrases like I'm done especially if you really don't mean it. You know, if you're trying to establish an ultimatum with them, saying I'm done, I'm leaving, if you don't do this, I won't be with you, that is not the way to do it because they're never going to forget that. I have clients who've been in relationships for over a decade and still bring up their partner saying five, six years ago that they were going to leave. So if you don't mean it, you need to be really, really careful with the person with avoidant attachment because there are roots there way before you were ever in the picture that you are messing with and that can have a really negative impact on your relationship. It might not have a huge effect on you. You probably don't care if they say those things to you, but for them, that is that could be a deal breaker, okay? And then for anybody dealing with somebody who might have a superiority complex. I personally find people with superiority complex or any sort of narcissistic qualities difficult to be in a relationship with because they tend to be very egocentric, meaning that they view everything in relation to how it impacts and affects them. But we'll talk more about that when we get to Chris and Paige's episode, I want to really emphasize for you the importance of making sure that you are asking them questions about evidence. When a person has all or nothing thinking or superiority, you have to ask them, and where's your evidence for that? Okay, you say you know about this, provide me with evidence about why your opinion is the right opinion. Okay, and you have to really go through very methodically with questioning so that they can see that they're making assumptions because it's just gonna feel right. But those things are assumptions. So those are two tips for dealing with those two personality types. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you don't watch Married at First Sight, it's a really, really good show, especially if you're interested in relationship dynamics. I just have been fascinated with the show from season one and a lot of the couples are still together. So it is an experience experiment that can work, but when it doesn't work, you guys, it usually is a huge crash and burn. I'm one of those people who doesn't like to see a lot of drama on that show. I love to see when the couples actually work out and they love each other and, you know, this is how they found their soulmate. I love those seasons. Um, and this season, we're not getting a lot of that. So I plan to do some more of these. If you haven't seen the show, maybe catch up and let me know what couple you'd like me to do next. Again, my name is Stephanie Yates Ayubwile. I ask that you like this video, subscribe to my channel, share it if you know anybody else who watches Married at First Sight and might enjoy this analysis of the couples. Thank you so much for watching until the end of the video. That actually really helps me with the algorithm and everything. So thank you. Thank Thank you, thank you.